Good morning. If you'd open up your word to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17, we'll be starting in verse 8 this morning. If you would, uh, read along with me, Exodus 17, verse 8. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek. While Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. Whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so that they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord the Lord will have war with the Melech from generation to generation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, God, I pray this morning as we go through this portion of Scripture, Lord, that, uh, Lord, that you reveal the truths that are found within it, God, that you are ultimately sovereign and in control, Lord, that we are called to action, Yet without divine intervention, without, without you, Lord, any of our action is pointless. God, I pray as we go through this text this morning, Lord, we just learn how important prayer is, Lord. God, I pray as we go through this text, we understand that we as Christians, Lord, are in a battle. A battle where we need to rely on you, Lord, that we need to rely on your strength, your might, Lord. God, I pray as we go through this passage, we are encouraged and convicted, Lord, to see our lives in the way that you have called us to see them, Lord, to see our Christian walk in the way that you have called us to see it, Lord. Be with us this morning, Lord, in your son's name, amen. Today we're going to continue Israel's journey in the wilderness. We've seen so far a number of trials that Israel has been put through, tests that God has brought to Israel. We've seen lack of water. We've seen them with a lack of food and again uh, a lack of water last week. Uh, today we see another trial. This time it's a trial that's an external trial. In fact, uh, we don't see Israel's heart in this trial uh, there's an external attack, a battle. The Amalekites come and fight with the Israelites. And this is the first battle or war we see the, the nation of Israel in. Of course, throughout the Old Testament, we see a, a whole history of battle after battle after battle. This is the very first one that we see. And I'd like to just jump in our text this morning. We have a lot to cover. And I have three points. Uh, they're pretty simple. Uh, the first point is this, the context the second point is the main point of this passage, so the context of what's going on, the main point of why what's happening is happening, and finally the application, what we can learn from this passage. So if we would start with the context, if you would look at Exodus chapter 17, again verse 8, it says this, Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Again, this is the first military battle that we see Israel engaged in with the Amalekites or the tribe of Amalek, that's what it's stated here in the ESV. Uh, these are distant cousins of the Israelites. In fact, if you go back to uh, uh, Genesis chapter 36, we see that Amalek is the grandson of Esau, who is Jacob's brother. 
This is a, a cousin tribe of the Israelites, and they are a nomadic people, and probably, from what I've studied, a most likely desert raiders or even desert pirates, they would attack travelers and steal their stuff as they would travel throughout the desert and the wilderness. What we know for sure about this attack is that it was both cowardly and brutal. We learn this from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 25 verse 17. Again, Deuteronomy is Moses reflecting back on the 40 years that Israel was in the wilderness. And he tells Israel to remember, look at verse 17, it says this, it should be on the board, yes. Verse 17, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt. Again, Moses is remembering what happened in Exodus 17. He says this, how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off your tail, those who were lagging behind you, and he did not fear God. In other words, the Amalekites came and attacked Israel when they were weak, and they specifically attacked the weak of Israel, meaning those who were lagging behind, probably women, children, the elderly, those that were sick. It was a cowardly action, probably a strategic action, but look at verse 8 again. It says this, Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Again, this is the first military battle we see Israel engage in. And this is well before Israel was ready to fight. Therefore, in verse 9, we see Moses as the leader of Israel make a very quick and decisive decision. Look at verse 9. It says this, So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men... And go out and fight Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. This is the first time in scripture that we're introduced to this character, Joshua, who of course becomes a very important historical figure for the Israelites. We see that after Moses dies, he becomes the leader of Israel in the book of Joshua. But Moses here tells Joshua, choose for us men and go and fight. Then Moses says this, I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Now I want you to picture this. As Joshua went to fight, with a sword in his hand, Moses went to a nearby hill with the staff of God in his hand. Now the text doesn't clearly say why this is, but verse 11 says this, that Moses held up his hand. He'd held up his hand, which scripturally was a posture of prayer. In fact, let me just show you why this scripturally is a posture of prayer. There's a few examples. We see it throughout all of the Bible, but Exodus 9, 29, Moses said to him, this is Pharaoh, he's talking to Pharaoh, he said to him, as soon as I have gone out of the city, I will stretch out my hands to the Lord. What's he doing there? He's saying, as soon as I go out of the city, I'm going to pray to God. I will stretch out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease, and there will be no more hail. In Psalm 63, verse 4, it says this, So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. Praying to the Lord. In fact, we even see this in the New Testament. 1 Timothy 2, verse 8 says this, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. So I think the best interpretation, and most commentaries I've read interpret it this way, that, that why Moses went to this hill was to pray. Again, verse 11 says that Moses held up his hand he was interceding. This is what Moses did for the Israelites throughout their time in the desert. He was interceding for the Israelites. Look again at verse 9. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight the Amalek. Moses tells Joshua to go. I just want you to think about this for a second. I, I've never been in the military. I know a lot of you have been in the military, but... 
I don't know what it's like as an officer in the military to send men to battle, to pick out you, you, and you, and say, go to the front lines. And you know what? You may die. But that's what Moses was doing. He told Joshua, pick out men, choose men, you, you go lead them to the front lines. Moses, on the other hand, who was probably in his 80s, and I think that's important, he was at an age where it wasn't practical for him to go out to the front lines and fight. He tells Joshua to go, but then he says this, Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. In other words, I will go and pray. Now I want you to think about this. The sword was in Joshua's hand, which is a symbol of fighting and war. It's a symbol of action, man's action. The staff was in Moses' hand which throughout Exodus was a symbol of divine intervention. In this verse, we just see a perfect picture of human responsibility. Joshua had to go. He had to go and fight and divine sovereignty, divine interaction. God, in other words, was ultimately in control. Human responsibility and divine sovereignty. Moses sent Joshua to fight. But Moses knew it would be pointless if God didn't intervene. So that's the context of our passage this morning. And the first point, the the second point, the the main point, I want to explain why why this is all happening. In fact, you come across this passage, and for many of us, we've probably read through it and go, I don't know exactly what's happening there. In fact, there's a couple passages in Exodus, we've hit a few of them already, where knowing that we were going to be preaching through Exodus, I knew I'd get there, and I wonder, huh, I wonder what I'm going to find when I start studying that passage, because I don't know exactly what's happening there. And this was one of them, but, but there is a main point. Look at verse 11. Look what happens. When Moses held up his hand, again, it's a symbol of prayer. When Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, because he got tired, Amalek prevailed. Now, in Hebrew, we don't see this as much in English, but in Hebrew, it's pretty obvious that this happened over and over and over again. In fact, as we go on in the story, we see that this happened all day, right, this battle. And it's clear that everyone saw it. Moses was on a hill where everyone could see him. Again, when Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And when Moses lowered his hand, the Amalekites prevailed. Meaning, everyone knew, everyone knew that the battle belonged to the Lord. It's interesting. As I was studying this passage this week, again, it's it's just an interesting passage. And I think a lot of people just don't know what to do with it. I came across so many different interpretations of the passages, like all types of interpretations. People would look at all the different details, the staff, Moses' hands, the hill, the two people he took with him, Joshua, the sword. They take all these details and they would almost allegorize them and find these d- deeper spiritual meanings of what is going on in this passage. And in doing so, I just really felt like most people were missing the main point. Which is super clear. Without God's intervention, Israel had no hope. Israel saw this as they were looking at Moses on the hill. The Amalekites saw this as the battle went back and forth. Moses saw this as he felt the weakness of his hands lowered and the Amalekites prevailing and his hand getting lifted up and the Israelites prevailing. But most important, Joshua saw this. In fact, again, this is the first introduction to this character, Joshua, who becomes a very important character in the history of Israel. But he becomes the focus of this passage. Look at verse 12. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it while... Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and one on the other side. 
So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua. That I utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Again, Joshua really becomes a focus of this battle. God tells Moses, write this as a memorial in a book. Let me just ask you this. What, what book do you think that is? The book of Exodus. He's the author of Exodus. God commanded Moses to write this in a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua. Joshua is the focus here. God is teaching Joshua a very important lesson. He's preparing him. Joshua will lead Israel, after Moses dies, into the promised land. But the promised land isn't free from its inhabitants. He's going to lead Israel into the promised land, into war. In fact, if you would, keep a bookmarker. We're going to be back in Exodus. But turn to Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. This book is named after the main character, Joshua. At this point, Moses is dead, as we'll see in the very first verse, meaning Moses has written the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, called the Law, or it's the Scriptures. Joshua has this as he's entering into the Promised Land. Joshua 1, verse 1 says this, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said, to Joshua, the son of Nun, Joshua's assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, you and all the people, into the land that I'm, going to get, or, that I'm giving the, to them, to the people of Israel. Let me just give you a context here. This is after the 40 years of wandering in the desert with the, the Israelites. They themselves have become a nomadic people in the wilderness, wandering. There's more than a million of these Israelites Moses, their leader, who's been their leader for 40 years, has just died. And Joshua is called to lead Israel into the land, lead Israel into war. Just think about how intimidating that would be. Look at verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go. Go. And go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this uh, Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. This is a massive land that is just given to the Israelites by God. Now look at verse 3 again. It says this, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you just as I promised to Moses. That phrase I have given to you in Hebrew is in present tense. It's, it's not future tense. It's not I will give to you. It's I have given to you. The land, in other words, is already yours, Joshua. The victory is already won. All you have to do is step onto the land. That's your responsibility. You need to go and lead the Israelites. Have faith. Be obedient. Listen to what I say and walk onto the land. Do what God tells you. Do what I tell you. Look at verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Then verse 6. Be strong and courageous. Why? Why be strong and courageous? Because the victory had already been won. I am with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. God is with Joshua. There is nothing to fear. Even though you're going to war, even though you're going to battle, there is nothing to fear, Joshua. I am with you. Therefore, verse 6, 
be strong and courageous. Or you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give to them. Only be strong and very courageous. The second time God calls Joshua to be strong and courageous, this time he says be very courageous. Which leads to a question. Strong in what? What strength? It's an important question. I've asked this question before, but what strength is, is, is Joshua to have as they go into the promised land, as they go into this battle? Is it Israel's military strength? No. They're a nomadic people. They've been wandering for 40 years. There's really nothing special when it comes to their military ability. And they, on top of all that, they're attacking established cities that had big walls around them. They're walled cities which were notoriously hard to conquer. When God commanded Joshua to be strong, he meant be strong in your faith. Trust me, Joshua. Trust me. This is how you will fight. In faith. This is how you exceed in your fighting. In faith, trusting me. Now go. I want you to think about it for a second. Again, I've asked this question, but I think it's important to ask. What was the first battle Joshua faced in the promised land? You can say it out loud. It's Jericho, right? We know that story. Historically true story. In fact, you can find the, the evidence of it to this day. Jericho was the first battle, which was a massive walled city. There was no hope these Israelites were going to take over the city. And what did God tell Joshua to do? Walk around it seven times, right, for seven days, and then yell at the walls. <laughs> right, that didn't make any sense. That wasn't some amazing battle plan, right? It's so important to think about this. Jericho, it, it's very clear when you go through the book of Exodus that everyone knew about what happened in Egypt, meaning the, the, the people in Jericho knew what happened in Egypt, meaning the people in Jericho knew that God's people were coming, that the Israelites belonged to God. So when they were fighting against the Israelites, who were they fighting against? God. Why were they so confident then? They had walls. They had faith in their walls. Who was Joshua called to have faith in? God. Look at verse 7 again. It says this. Only be strong and very courageous. How? How is he supposed to be strong and very courageous? Well, God tells him, be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, has commanded you. The law of Moses right now is the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. It was Scripture. Pay attention to Scripture. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your ways prosperous, and then you will have good success. Again, look at verse 8. This book of the law, right, that's scripture, that's Exodus. It's part, of, part of it is Exodus. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. You shall meditate on the book of the law day and night. Let me ask you a question. What was in the book of the law? Just think about it. Our passage this morning. Israel's first battle with the Amalekites. In fact, Exodus 17, 14 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book. In other words, Joshua was called to meditate on this day and night, meaning every night after they went around the walls, they came back, and my guess is Joshua was saying, Remember the Amalekites. And God's ultimately in control. Let's just be faithful and obedient. 
God was commanding Moses in Exodus, Exodus 17, to write it down, to write down what happened with the Malachites as a memorial to encourage and to remind Joshua. In fact, let me read Exodus 17, 14 again. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua. Moses, don't let Joshua forget. The battle with the Amalekites was a lesson. God was teaching the Israelites. He was teaching Joshua. And he learned that the battle would be won only by God's intervention. That when Joshua and the Israelites went to war, it would only be won by God's grace. It would only be won in faith in him. Look at verse 9. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9 says this. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua needed to be encouraged because he was heading to war. And he was going to be leading God's people into war. And God was reminding Joshua what he learned. Now turn back to Exodus chapter 17. We'll pick up back in verse 14. Verse 14 again says this. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, the Lord is my banner. The Lord is my banner, the capital L-R-D, of course, that's the name of God, Yahweh, the name that's been revealed to Moses and the Israelites. In other words, this is a title given to Yahweh. Yahweh is my banner. Let me uh, read what one theologian wrote about this title. He wrote this. A banner is a military standard, a piece of cloth bearing an army insignia and raised on a pole. Soldiers always looked to their banner. It established their identity, helped them know who they are. On the battlefield, it also helps them keep their bearing and giving them courage and hope. As long as their banner is still flying, they knew that the battle is not lost. The Israelites had some practical experience with this. From time to time during the battle with the Amalekites, they would look up on the hillside. There, they would see Moses holding up the staff that symbolized God's power. It was their banner, their military standard. Now Moses was pointing them to the real source in courage and strength, which was not simply the staff, but God himself. This was to be their rallying cry, the Lord is my banner. Again, Exodus 15, Exodus chapter 17, verse 15 says, and Moses built an altar and called the name of it, the Lord is my banner, saying, a hand upon the throne of the Lord, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. We find out in the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, all the way to the, um, the exile that, the Amalekites continued to battle with the Israelites until finally God wiped out all of the Amalekites. Now, again, this is a very unusual story, but I do think its main purpose is very clear. It was to encourage Joshua, it was to teach the Israelites, and to, especially to teach Joshua that God is his strength, that God is his standard, that God is his banner. So that's the context of this passage and, and the main point of this passage. I do want to look at the application of this passage, and I do believe there's a few things we can learn in our Christian walk from this passage. In fact, 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That means every little portion of Scripture, we can learn something from, from it from, for our Christian walk. Paul, in fact, says, as we've talked about in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6, 
that these things, and the these things, the context here is the time Israel was in the wilderness, these things took place as examples for us. So there are things that we can learn from this passage, and I have four application points, four application points, four things that I think we can take away from this passage. And the first one is this. Christianity is war. Christianity is war. It's one thing we learn from our passage today. It's simply that Christianity is war. It's just like Israel was in the enemy's territory in the wilderness. Listen, we are in the enemy's territory. Our enemy is the prince of power of the air, the spirit that is now worked in the sons of disobedience. That's Ephesians 2. The Bible is just so clear about this, that Christianity is war. We are at war. War against the flesh. War against lust. War against sin. War against this world. Again, not people, not not flesh and blood. Flesh and blood, people, they're our mission field, but the, the evil world system that is everywhere that hates God and hates God's people. Christianity is war. In fact, if you would, turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. I think many of us are familiar with this passage It says this in verse 10. Finally, be strong. What's that sound like? It's the same command that was given to Joshua as he was going to lead God's people into the promised land, into war, is given to us. Be strong. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Not our abilities, not who we are, but in God's strength and his might, put on the whole armor of God. There's so many people that love this passage, the armor of God. I, I just hear people talk about it all the time. But what is the implication of armor? Why do we need to put on armor? Because we are at war. In fact, I think so many Christians get picked off by the enemy because there's a lack of pastors and churches and Christians out there, especially in America, that preach that we are at war. We're just so comfortable. But we are at war. Look at verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Our enemy is not the Amalekites. It's not flesh and blood. In fact, we need to be careful that we don't make flesh and blood our enemies. They're a mission field. The the Amalekites in the Old Testament was a type of a greater enemy that we face as a church. Our enemy is Satan and his army of demons. Powerful, smart, well-organized. And listen, it's super important. We have no hope against them without God's intervention. Without God's strength. Without God's armor. That's why verse 13, look at verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, withstand in the the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Our first application point that I believe we can learn from Exodus chapter 17 is that we are at war. The second application point I think we can learn is that our war is won through prayer. Our war is won through prayer. Look at Ephesians 6, verse 14. Again, this is the armor of God. It's very familiar to 
probably most of us in here. Again, it says this, verse 14. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the, the, the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Every one of those things is a defensive posture. We stand in a defensive posture besides one article of, of the, the armor, and that is our weapon, the sword. It's the only offensive weapon we have, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Right? Joshua went into battle with a physical sword. We, the church, have the word. Which is, by the way, living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. <laughs> I mean, this is more powerful than, than any sword. It's more powerful than any physical weapon that's out there. And we're called to use it, we're called to proclaim it. Look at verse 18 again. We have all the armor of God, and then he says this, Paul, praying, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. And what's interesting about this passage is that prayer is not armor. I just think that's interesting because if I was to list what I, I thought God would make as armor, right, the word of God would be in there, but definitely prayer. But it's not armor. Prayer is the manner or the way or the method in which we engage into battle. Moses understood this in Exodus 17. He made sure that prayer was the manner in which the Israelites went into battle. Right? He told Joshua, right, go to the front lines. And then he said this, tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. And Moses understood that prayer was just as important as Joshua's actions. The battle would have been won, would be won through prayer. Brings me to the third application point. And this is super important. We fight together. We fight together. Look at verse 18 again. It says this, Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplications for all the saints. Paul is saying, hey, we are at war. Make sure you pray for all the saints. It's one of the reasons we get up here and pray for the other churches in Tehachapi. We are called to pray for all the saints. We are called to pray for each other within this body. We're called to pray for each other and with each other, making supplications for all the saints. In fact, look at verse 13, Ephesians 6, verse 13. And you know, I love the English language. It's the only one I know. There's things that bug me about it. And one of the biggest ones is found in verse 13. It says this, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you. You know, we read the armor of God and we think this is a personal thing, that I need to put on the armor of God and get ready to go battle. It's my personal battles that I have, but in Greek, that you is not singular. It's plural. It's you all. We're in Texas, y'all. I think that's less sophisticated, it's more. Listen to it. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you all, all of you, all of you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. We stand together as a body. Therefore, when we pray, we should pray for one another, making supplications for all the saints Listen, if we go into battle by ourselves, we will lose. Let's make that clear. There's no such thing in Christianity as an army of one. I mean, if there was the closest thing to, to Christianity or someone, the, the, a follower of God that was an army of one right next to Jesus, 
It was an army of one, but that's different. It would be Moses. But even Moses didn't go into battle alone. Who did he take with him? Who did he take with him on the hill? Aaron and her. He didn't go alone. When Moses was weak and weary, which will happen in battle, they were there to support him and help him. Let me just read Exodus 17, 12. It says this, But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and one on the other side, so his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. They needed each other. Moses needed Aaron and her. Which brings me to my fourth and final application point. And if there's any that I want you to hear this morning, it's this one. We need to pray for those who are on the front lines. We need to pray for those who are on the front lines. Exodus 17.9 says this. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go. And go out and fight, Joshua. Go out and fight with Amalek. Joshua, you're going to the front lines. In fact, Moses sent Joshua to the front lines. He said, pick out a few men, go to the front lines. Joshua, you may die, but go. And one of the reasons Moses chose Joshua was that he was young and able. I'm sure there's many more reasons why Joshua was Moses' assistant, eventually became the leader of Israel. But one of the reasons was Moses was older in his 80s, and Joshua was young and able. He says, go, but then he says, Joshua, you're going to the front lines, but tomorrow I will stand on the hill, the top of the hill, with the staff of God in my hand. Joshua, you're going to the front lines, possibly to sacrifice everything where the war is hot, where it's it's most dangerous. But I will do my part for you and pray. What's interesting about Exodus 14, and it's the reason I jumped into Ephesians 6, is that there's a correlation between the two. You're talking about warfare. There's a correlation. At the end of the book of Ephesians, right after the armor of God passage, right after Paul talking about the spiritual warfare, the most descriptive passage in all of Scripture about spiritual warfare, Paul, who was on the front lines of the battle, just like Joshua, right? Paul, who was in prison at this point when he was writing the book of Ephesians because of the gospel, asked the church to pray for him. Look at verse 18 again. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, verse 19, and also for me. Paul is asking the church at Ephesus, pray for me. Pray for me as as I am a prisoner. Pray for me as I am on the front lines with the gospel taking ground for the kingdom. Pray for me. And listen to what he asked the church to pray for. Verse 19. And also for me, in other words, pray for me that the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mysteries of the gospel. You know what he doesn't pray for? Safety. He doesn't ask, hey, pray for my safety. You know what he doesn't ask for? to be freed from prison. He doesn't ask that, that his life may be saved, uh, that his head wouldn't get chopped off, which eventually happened to Paul. He asked that he would share the gospel well, that he'd use the sword well. Verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. You know what the implication of this is? Just like Moses, I want you to hear this. Just like Moses, we, the church, we have been given the duty and the privilege. I, I think Moses thought, 
praying for Joshua was both a duty on his end, but a privilege too. We've been given the duty and the privilege to pray consistently, earnestly, with perseverance for our cross-cultural workers. Who are undoubtedly on the front lines of the battle. Taking new ground for the kingdom. Proclaiming Christ where he has never been proclaimed before. In places that are dangerous. You know why we call them cross-cultural workers? Because saying missionary is dangerous for our cross-cultural workers. We're just trying to get rid of that word because we put a name with the word missionaries that could get them kicked out of that country or worse. Therefore, we say cross-cultural workers. I mean, these young families that have sacrificed so much for the sake of the gospel. I'd encourage you. In fact, for whatever reason, in the next few months, we have a number of them home for different reasons. I encourage you to get to know them and just kind of hear their story and see how much they actually have sacrificed. We have a young couple that are interns right now that we're going to be sending. They grew up in this church. And they're armed with one thing, the sword. We should be praying for our cross-cultural workers. That's what Paul was. He was a cross-cultural worker, by the way. You know, Romans 15, and you just stop there. And You know, the, the Romans, one of the greatest books ever written, period. One of the greatest epistles Paul ever wrote. You know what it is? It's a letter asking for support for missions. <laughs> it's asking the church at Rome to support him as he's going to go to Spain. Well, why is he going to Spain? Well, he tells them in in verse 20 in chapter 15, he says, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named. Meaning the whole Roman Empire had little churches throughout all of it. And he says, I need to go somewhere else. There's churches. Their duty is to evangelize that area. I need to go plant a church where Christ has not been named. And Rome, you're going to help me do it. (laughs) Paul was a cross-cultural worker. He crossed cultures for the sake of the gospel. And in Ephesus, he was asking the church to pray for him. Two things in particular. One, that God would give him the words. Verse 19 says that the words may be given to me, that I may, in other words, proclaim the gospel clearly. That it may be understood. And second, that he would speak boldly. Right, that he would declare the gospel boldly as I ought to speak. Paul was on the front lines of the battle and he asked the church to support him by praying. Just like Moses supported Joshua who was on the front lines of the battle. Listen, if you've been sitting under my preaching for long enough, you know I have a heart for cross-cultural work. I pray that we as a church have a heart like Moses who couldn't go because he was too old. He couldn't go for, for a number of reasons. But he wasn't going to send Joshua into battle without covering him in prayer. And listen, prayer matters. There's a mystery here, and I want to be clear in the passage this morning. Man's responsibility, right? Man's actions and God's sovereignty, divine intervention. I mean, just think about this. When Moses held up his hands, what is that? Man's actions. When Moses held up his hands, Israel prevailed. What's that? Divine intervention. When Moses lowered his hands, the Amalekites prevailed. Listen, I pray that our lack of prayer never gets in the way of the gospel. I just just pray as a church that our lack of prayer never gets in the way of the work of our cross-cultural workers who are on the front lines sent by our church. We have three couples that have been sent by our church, and we're about to have four. In fact, This passage is a perfect passage to introduce what we're going to be doing for the next, really, month, the next three weeks. Next three weeks, we have guest speakers coming. They're all going to be talking about missions and the importance of sending well. We really ask the speakers to come and really 
aim on what we should be doing as cinders. What is our calling? What, what should we do? That's what we want to focus on in this next week. I, I really want us as a church to just picture Moses on that hill as Joshua is going to the front lines. How can we be diligently praying and supporting our cross-cultural workers? I, I, I just hope this, this sermon, and more importantly than the sermon, the passages that we went over, Exodus 17 and, and Ephesians 6, just brings a conviction to want to sin well. A conviction to pray at the end of the three weeks, on March 26, which is a Saturday morning, we're going to have a cross-cultural workers conference. I've mentioned it. It was on the slideshow. It's called Sit with the Gospel. We're going to have a couple people teaching. It'll just be a morning thing. One of them will be Pastor Andy, so I encourage you there to come to hear Pastor Andy speak on suffering because suffering and sacrifice is a big part of this for those that are going. We'll have sign-ups online eventually. And you'll get more details as it comes. My thing is, if we're going to sin, right, which we're called to do, let's be like Moses. Let's sin well. Let's sin in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, I thank you for the passage this morning, Lord. I thank you the lesson that's taught, Lord, that, that without your intervention, Lord, without, without your sovereignty, all of our efforts is just pointless. Yet at the same time, you have called us to action. How those two things go together, I don't know, Lord. And we read this passage in Exodus chapter 17, Lord, where, where Joshua was called to go and fight, yet it all depended on you. It's clear in that passage God, I pray that we find a, a perfect balance in that, Lord, that we send our, our cross-cultural workers well, Lord, that we prepare them the best we can, knowing it all depends on you. And in knowing it all depends on you, Lord, I pray that we pray that we do our part, Lord. For us that haven't been called to go, Lord, we've been called to support. We've been called to pray. Just like Moses called the church, at, or Paul called the church at Ephesus to pray for him as he took the gospel, the places that the gospel has never been, Lord, I pray that our heart is to pray for those that are doing the same thing. Be with us, your son's name. Amen.
in this life to fight the sword of your word and, and the power of prayer. Lord, help us to be skillful with those weapons. Uh, help us to covet them and uh, cherish them, Lord. And in so doing, love you more and more. Uh, Lord, thank you for assurance. Thank you for Christ, our light, our strength, our song, cornerstone, solid ground, our anchor in this storm, in the storms of life. Uh, Lord, be with us as we as we go our ways today. Thank you for Jesus. Let's pray. Amen. God bless you.